Okay, this is uh, part two uh, of excerpts reading from the book Poor Man's Way to Fight Cancer, also called the uh, Cancer Picture Book. So this right here is a picture of Dave Schultz and Mark Schultz, their brothers. That's the Stanford uh, Hoover uh, building there. And those are the red roofs of the Stanford University. These are the Palo Alto foothills, the Bay Hills. We used to run for wrestling practice. And uh, when I started out as a freshman over there, we ran sprints as a team. And Dave was fatter. And he, I remember seeing this guy. He was fat. We go lift weights in the weight room. He was weak. He was slow at running. I'm like, how did a guy who's fat, weak, and slow become national champion? Um, and it turned out when he was young, he was a fat kid with dyslexia. And the other kids would make fun of him and pick on him. His nickname was Pudge. And he got called things like, you know, fat dumbass because he couldn't read too well. And he liked wrestling a lot. And he really had a knack for learning technique. And he would travel around in junior high. He'd go to the high school, learn the technique from the high school guys. And he'd go to the ride his bike over to the college. He was only a couple blocks away, and he learned from the college guys. And basically, he learned techniques so well, he became the best technical wrestler in the whole world. And even though physically he doesn't really have that much talent, he became great. And so what I'm saying here is that you know, a lot of people, you know, you say to yourself, gee, I don't really have much money. How am I going to deal with this problem? And so what I'm saying here is to learn everything you can learn about cancer and all the little things you can do, it can add up and make a giant uh, improvement in your results. Okay. There you go, Pops. All right, thank you. So here it is, basic. Yeah. I'm, I'm making a video, Holmes. All right, so how do you win when you have no money? How do you win when you don't have much talent? Here's the secret. Willingness to learn is a great talent. Learning a bunch of small skills can add up to be a great talent. You can learn everything about cancer prevention. You can do a whole bunch of little things that add up. Each one seems insignificant almost by itself, but they all add up to a big benefit. Um, and I, I've, I've, I've used this technique for school. I've seen other people use it for other things. It works, okay? This is a smart way to approach things. So here's another picture of Mark and Dave Schultz. They both not only were national champions, multiple times became world and Olympic champions. And so the approach of Dave, I call it incrementalism, to learn a whole bunch of little things that together add up to a big thing, okay? Um, and sometimes if you can find a special thing, like in wrestling, it's learn technique, that you can learn a thousand times more technique than other people. You can only be a little bit better in terms of physical strength and conditioning. Um, for Mark, I learned this idea of intensity or purpose. He was so obsessed with wrestling, he didn't care about anything else in the whole world. And one time he said to me, the only thing I own in this world is a motorcycle, and it's a piece of crap. All he cared about was wrestling. And it would be amazing. He'd wear sunglasses and not even speak to anybody a week before a big tournament. But when it came out you know, to compete, his like energy was off the charts, and he, he was awesome in competition. Okay, so um, I had had some recurrent injuries, and you know, even though I was a varsity starter and above 500 record, you know, the coach was kind of disappointed in me. Um, and he sort of, I was sort of a Chicago guy. You know, my nickname was a Chicago Hood in a sense, and that was sort of like Chicago guys were kind of frowned on. That was the land of California guys, and so um, the coach had even was pressuring me to give up my scholarship, which I didn't want to do because I knew if I could get over my injury, I, I could really improve a lot. And Mark Schultz said, Pete, you don't need to quit. You got to hang around with the wrestlers. Move to a wrestler fraternity. You train with me. And so I just started hanging around with him. He told me all these wrestling stories about, you know, winning national championships, world championships, about all these other great wrestlers. And my confidence just dramatically went up. I'm like, wow, if he can do that, why can't I at least, you know, beat this guy from this team, beat this guy from this team? And then I wrestled in all the uh, summer tournaments, and I dramatically improved. I became student athlete of the year at Stanford, set the school record for most wins in a season, all of this stuff, and uh, was team captain after that and stuff. So all that came from hanging around with him and being obsessed about getting better at wrestling. Before, you know, Stanford guys, a lot of them thought of wrestling as a hobby. It was kind of fun, keeps you in shape. But school was the most important thing, and, uh, you know, for him, wrestling was the most important thing in life over everything. Um, so anyways, you do incrementalism, you try to learn every little thing about cancer, and you put everything else in your life on the back burner, intensity of, of focus and purpose, by that I mean I think you should retire from your job or at least take a prolonged vacation and just focus on what you can do to heal and to get better. I think your odds will go up quite a bit. And this is you know a typical example of uh, you know the wrestlers like some of the guys who I trained with. You know I used to be a lot better than this guy in high school, yeah, but he ended up being 
All-American national champion. That was pretty typical of a lot of the guys I knew when I was younger. You know, they just kept on getting better and better and becoming All-Americans and national champions. And because of my injuries, I never uh, got as good as I wanted to be or expected to be originally in wrestling. And that was real hard for me. And so I had to deal with that. And, um, you know, and that was psychologically difficult for me. How do you bounce back from a giant shocking disappointment? Um, and so, like I said, I basically used the Dave Schultz and Mark Schultz approach to school. I just learned everything you can learn about getting good at school and was intensely focused on it because there was nothing else to do. Stanford's like in the middle of nowhere. It's like in, the, in a field. It's like they call it the barn. It's an old farm. So there was no town. There were no parties. There were no bars. I didn't know a single person. I'm from Chicago. Stanford's a million miles away from there. All my friends at the state schools were telling me about how they go to the bars, you know, several nights a week, all these girls, all these fun stories. And here's my picture of Stanford. I was the lonely guy. I'm sitting here in my dorm room. There are no parties. There's never going to be a party. There's no women to go out with. I only asked out one girl in four years at Stanford. It's not like I got rejected. She rejected me that one time I asked her out. But there were no other girls to ask out. There were no parties. There were no social events. I didn't know any girls. I mean, you go into some classroom, there's you know 300 people in the room, you're in a giant lecture hall, you don't know anybody. Most of the kids there are from the West Coast, so they know some kids from the West Coast. I didn't know a single person. Um, all right, so I, here's my calendar on the wall, counting the days to go home, I see my old high school girlfriend, eventually her and me split, so I didn't have a girlfriend for years. All these guys were great athletes. Usually if you're an athlete in high school, you're a high status uh, person and it's easy to have a girlfriend, but at Stanford, you know, there was this attitude over there that all oh, wrestlers are a bunch of thugs. Same with football players. Why should they even get scholarships? So it was not very high status at all. Plus, it's out in California to be a wrestler. Anyway, so the, the whole point was the Dave and Mark Schultz approach to getting good at something is very useful for anybody. And also, we had an intense sense of meritocracy, man. There was a wall of fame. Schultz brothers are on top. And to, to have your pictures move up on this wall, we all knew who was doing what in wrestling. And, you know, I had the most wins on the team, but that was really not as good of a thing as it sounds because the other guys like, you know, like this is Dave Lee, he would win four matches in a row and uh, win a tournament, whereas I would, you know, fight my way through the wrestlebacks and end up like six and two or something and end up, you know, third or fifth or something. But So that's why I would have more wins than him, but he was actually, you know, a better wrestler. He was an All-American national champion. Um and I just took all my sadness and frustration, though, and put it into academics. That's what happened to me. And it works. So what I'm trying to say is it's, you do the same thing as a cancer patient. You basically take all your energy, your sadness, and your frustration, and all that energy that you just put in other parts of your life, and you put it into getting better. Um, another thing, too, a good metaphor for thinking is the five or six blind men in an elephant. It's an Indian uh, story. So... You know, first guy comes along, blind man, feels the elephant's tail and says, oh, it's a rope. Next guy feels the side of the elephant says it's a wall. One guy feels the leg and says, oh, it's a tree trunk. Another guy feels the tusk, says it's a spear, feels the ear, says it's a rug. The point being is if you just jump to conclusions or you're emotional and you're thinking, you'll only recognize one part of the problem and you'll often do something stupid like agree to chemo or surgery when that's not the best thing for you. Maybe it is the best thing for you in some cancers, but you come to that conclusion based on having studied it from multiple different perspectives in some detail and having talked to other people. Okay, so that's how you make good decisions. Like Aristotle said, the first step to an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. You have to get an objective sense so you can kind of stand above it and have a bird's eye view and recognize I'm dealing with an elephant. Okay, that's real important. Um, I talked about in cancer before. Am I dealing with a rabbit? Am I dealing with a vulture? Am I dealing with a turtle? Those are three different types of cancer. We'll, we'll talk about this more later. So you want to see the big picture. Um, like I said, a typical patient gets all emotional. I got cancer, cut it out, cut it out. And then they'll have a, like a prostate surgery they didn't need and they'll end up impotent with urinary incontinence. Okay. The other thing too, whenever you want to get good at something, you should study the people who are already good at it. Like you want to recover from cancer, study Ruth Heydrich, okay? Study Janet Murray Wakelin. They both survived metastatic breast cancer for decades. Same thing with Lorraine Day, okay? She's a real smart lady. She survived it, okay? Uh, she's a physician. Chris Wark, he survived metastatic colon cancer for decades, okay? Read about these people and other people who've had incredible survival and see what you can learn from them. Um, and religion, too. Religion gets mocked in, in modern 
academic university places because they're they're always pushing atheistic Darwinism because they're all part of this Marxist push towards communism return and development in America. But when you study like who are the healthiest people, they're all religious. Okay, religion gives people a sense of purpose and meaning in their life. It unites people together so they they help each other more. So, you know, religare like the Latin means to to ligate together. Ligate is to tie to tie together. Social bond people. And they're more connected. They help each other. It lowers their stress value. They're happy. So it's a big part of being healthier. I've seen some cancer patients who that made a tremendous improvement in their life. Okay, now, now this is chapter two. We'll just do a little bit from chapter two. So basically, here's the three major phases of cancer. Initiation, which is typically thought of being DNA damage, but it can also be thought of as a DNA transformation, changing to a different pattern of life. The classic theory, somatic mutation theory, says a mutagenic chemical or virus damages DNA and it'll damage a gene related to controlling cell replication and thus the cell becomes cancerous. The metabolic theory of cancer says hypoxia makes the cell realize it can't run on aerobic metabolism. There's no oxygen and quite often it'll die or go into apoptosis, programmed cell death. But instead some cells, instead of doing that, will transition into becoming like an anaerobic bacteria, running on anaerobic metabolism without oxygen. So that's the metabolic theory of cancer. That's the one I think is by far more correct than the somatic mutation theory. But most of the traditional books and chemotherapy are all based on somatic mutation theory. All right. The next phase of cancer is now you already have a tumor, and there's a question of what rate is it going to grow at? What's the doubling time? You know, often the doubling time is said to often be around 100 days, but it varies quite a bit from tumor to tumor. So anyways, what I'm saying is animal protein speeds up tumor growth, okay? And these other things, estrogenic chemicals, iron, high insulin levels, you know, from insulin resistance, high fat diets, anything that activates mTOR, they all speed up cancer growth. If you suppress the immune system, cancer grows faster. faster. So these are all things you want to avoid. But the good news is, and here's pretty much where the, where the game is won and lost and the, and the question of tumor promotion. So you want to do everything you can to slow that tumor from growing, and we're going to talk about how to do it. There's lots of things you can do to slow down mTOR. You can slow down mTOR by avoiding animal protein. So you avoid methionine and leucine. You can avoid iron, like in meat or in uh, iron-fortified foods. Iron is needed also to activate mTOR. You can avoid high fats, because high fats indirectly increase mTOR because they activate um, insulin resistance, which increases insulin, insulin-like growth factor, and those then um, activate mTOR to speed up cell replication. All those things are doable, you can prevent. You get your sleep, you get your exercise, you get along with people, maintain some good relationships, you have your sense of religion, your sense of purpose in life. All of those things will improve immune function and those will help remove cancer cells, okay? There's a few other things you can do to prevent metastatic disease and tumor invasion that help to reduce it. You keep your cells well oxygenated, okay? You avoid dietary salt, which can uh, cause your platelets to stick together and hide cancer cells when they're metastasizing. You avoid things that cause acidosis, things like eating meat, um, for example, okay? So that's basically how, what it comes down to the whole game of trying to prevent cancer is Learn what causes cancer, makes it grow, and then stop doing those things. That's very logical. Okay, this pretty much summarizes what we were talking about. Also, sodium chloride is a tumor promoter in the sense because the sodium, like I said, can hide metastasizing cancer cells in the blood. The platelets will wrap around it, and then the immune system can't find it because its outer cell surface plasma membrane antigens are not visible to them. Okay, chloride displaces bicarbonate ions in the blood, thus leads to a low-grade metabolic acidosis. A acidotic hypoxic milieu microenvironment around the tumor cells promotes cancer growth over the growth and the control of the surrounding cells. Uh, you need your immune system to remove cancer cells. That's why you don't want to suppress your immune system. That's one of the major problems with chemo. You need your immune system to remove cancer cells. Well, if your chemo is wiping out your immune system, how are you going to fight the cancer cells? Now, don't get me wrong. You know, this has been described by Suresh Mukherjee in his book, Cancer, Emperor of All Maladies, as being like plain chicken. And you sort of like, you want enough chemo to destroy the cancer, but not destroy the body too. And it can be very difficult to titrate that amount. Okay. You want to lower your stress because that will suppress the immune system and you want to avoid things like caffeine. Okay. Now, a bacteria is a cell without a nucleus. So pro means before, karyote means nut or nucleus. A eukaryote is a cell with a nut, meaning nucleus. Okay, so people tend to think the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote is whether or not there's a nucleus. 
but that's not really the most important point. Nucleus is where the DNA, DNA is in a eukaryote cell. In a prokaryote cell, it's just floating around in the cytoplasm of the DNA. The real important difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote, so this is a prokaryote, it's a bacteria. A eukaryote is the cells like in humans, is mitochondria. The mitochondria allow a tremendous increase in energy production, and that's how you can do all kinds of complex work, and that's what makes it possible to have complex multicellular organisms like, like humans. Okay, um, you means true in Greek. So here's the basic mitochondria. There's the outer mitochondrial membrane, OMM. There's the intramembranous space, IMS. That's the space between the outer mitochondrial membrane and this green inner mitochondrial membrane. Then within the, the green of the inner mitochondrial membrane is the matrix of the mitochondria. So the matrix is where Krebs cycle runs along this inner membrane, that's where the electron transport chain runs. This intermembrane space, that's where the protons are pumped. Okay, here is the normal inner mitochondrial membrane and electron transport chain. And electrons are passed along like a fireman's bucket brigade from complex one to coenzyme Q, complex three, complex four, uh, complex 2 does not pump a proton, but it does pass them along to coenzyme Q. And the ultimate electron acceptor is oxygen. And that's because it has the most electronegativity of all the electron uh, carriers here. And that means it wants to grab the electrons. Oxygen has a very high electronegativity. The only element that has more is, is fluoride. And so it'll grab those electrons, be converted into water. You know, some hydrogens are added to it as well. And that's, that takes those electrons, you know, out of the loop. Um, and this is how energy is made. As the electrons are passed down, that energy is coupled to pumping protons into the inter intermembranous space, which builds up a pressure gradient of protons. Hydrogen H plus is a proton. And then that proton can be brought back in through ATP synthase to produce an ATP. And ATP is adenosine triphosphate. ADP is adenosine diphosphate. When the phosphate is added to the ADP, it becomes ATP. So instead of having di having two phosphates, it becomes ATP with three phosphates. And that's the energy of the cell. That's the $20 bill of a cell for energy currency. Okay. The reason why I spend time on this electron transport stuff is this is how energy is made on life. This is what it's all about, is making energy in the mitochondria. Anything that damages the mitochondria will tend to increase the risk of cancer in the cell. So again, the electrons are, are passed down through these electron carriers and that's used to provide energy to pump protons out. And then the proton is harvested, in a sense, at the end of the line by ATP synthase. And that will then take an adiphosphate to ADP, adenosine di as in 2-phosphate, to adenosine tri as in 3-phosphate. And that's how most of the energy in the human body is made. And you need oxygen to do it. Okay, so here's showing what the difference is between a normal cell and a cancer cell. A normal cell in the human body is a worker. It has a job. If you're part of the liver, you have to do a lot of work that a liver cell needs to do. The liver is a metabolic workhouse of the body. So it has to maintain a normal blood glucose level during fasting. It stores glycogen, which is a stored form of a polymer of carbohydrate or glucose, and it'll break that down, chop off little pieces of glucose and send them into the blood to maintain blood glucose during fasting. It also produces bile, which is the liquid used for dissolving and digesting fats that is stored in the gallbladder. It also detoxifies tons of chemicals from the, all over the human body. So the bottom line is these cells have to do tons of work. They need to make tons of ATP to do their work. Cancer cells not like that. A cancer cell is a cell that said, look, I'm not getting enough oxygen. I cannot make enough energy. I'm either going to die and go into apoptosis or I'm going to just replicate as fast as I can and get the hell out of here. I'm going to go find an apartment somewhere else, metastasize to another location where there's more favorable living conditions. So a cancer cell, in order to double itself, to replicate, it has to make a copy of itself. And so it needs to do a lot of synthesis. So this is totally different. Regular cell is a worker needs to make energy, ATP. Cancer cell is interested in just replicating. So it needs to make a lot of proteins, a lot of nucleic acids, as well as membrane lipids and whatnot. So it can run especially on glucose, but it can also run especially on glutamine. That's the problem with keto paleo diets is it can run everything off of glutamine, which is a very common amino acid. So you, you can't starve cancer 
just by trying to lower dietary glucose. That's not going to work. Um, okay. What you really want to do, like what would I do if I had cancer? I would want to deprive it of leucine, methionine, iron, and lipids. Um, in order to make a copy of itself, the cancer cell has to replicate all its DNA and RNA, and there's a lot of it. A typical normal human cell has 3.3 billion, that's 3.3 B as in billion, base pairs of DNA. So it takes lots of carbon skeleton building blocks to make all that. And it's going to need amino acids like a lot of leucine and methionine. It's going to need a lot of iron. Uh, there's a lot of enzymes in the electron transport, transport system are also dependent on, um, on iron. So uh, it's going to need all this stuff and it has to make tons of membrane lipids. A cancer cell, in a sense, is kind of stupid. It just wants to replicate. And this is what they'll do, let's say, in a Petri dish. Grow really fast, then they'll hit a plateau phase, and then they just deplete all their resources and die. And the problem is in humans, they do something similar, and then they just die, and the patient dies with them. So they're not, they don't have a good strategy for life long term. This, paint, this picture just shows the main mutation that occurs in a cancer cell. It's not so much that it's a mutation, it's just the cell switches over to anaerobic metabolism. And the key metabolic step is upregulation of this enzyme hexokinase 2, which is very unique in the sense that we'll call it HK2. It binds to the outer mitochondrial membrane and it stabilizes something called the VDAC, you know, the voltage dependent anion channel on the outer mitochondrial membrane, and that helps prevent it from going into apoptosis. It is also being on the outer mitochondrial membrane. It can grab any ATPs real quick, you know, if the mitochondria is still making ATPs. And it does other things to inhibit uh, apoptosis. So this is the key step that's seen in almost all cancers. And it's a predictable thing, a way to transform into an anaerobic bacteria with the idea being that cancer cells are reverting to a primitive program. One small tumor, here the size of a grape is about five grams, and the point is that a very small tumor can release tons and tons of metastatic cancer cells into the blood, so you need your immune system to clear those. And then, let's say the doubling time of a tumor is about 100 days. This came from a lecture from Dr. McDougall. Here's a journal article of it. And what he basically says is by the time you can detect a cancer, see it on a CAT scan, or you know a mammogram or most other things, it's usually relatively big. It usually already has micro metastases to other tissues like the bone, the lungs, the liver, or lymph nodes. So most of the time, by the time you can diagnose it, it's already spread. So you know, is it really a rabbit or in terms of the types of cancer, rabbits, vultures, and um, turtles? And what this means is you're going to have to do something to deal with the micrometastases. Even if you cut out the main primary tumor, there's probably micrometastases spread of the tumor to other locations. And that's why all this stuff is so important because the cancer cells are all over the place. You can't cut them out. You have to have a way that the immune system can remove them. Okay. Um... This is what I was saying, that one gram of tumor, you know, much smaller than a grape, can shed over a million cancer cells into the blood in one day. Okay, here's the article uh, that was showing that. So the immune system has to remove all those cells. That's why you, we want to have a good immune system. This is an interesting paper by Thomas Seifried. He's a pretty famous guy. He's got a bunch of lectures on the Internet. And he has a book called Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. And his research basically showed that what's causing cancer to occur in the progeny, the offspring, it's not coming from the nucleus. So the somatic mutation theory doesn't work. It's coming from the cytoplasm, okay? It's coming from the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, not from the DNA and the nucleus. You know, based on he made these cell-cell hybrids by taking, let's say, the cytoplasm of one cell and combining it with the nucleus of another cell. And the combination that led to cancer growth was if you took the uh, mitochondria and cytoplasm from a cancer cell, that would give you cancer. The DNA didn't matter so much. Here's cancer DNA in the red, and it produces a normal offspring cell. But if you've got a cancerous mitochondria and cytoplasm, that'll produce cancer offspring. Okay, so that fits with the mitochondrial um, metabolic theory of cancer.
this is what was meant by the three types of cancer. Imagine you're a farmer and you owned, let's say, a 100, uh, 100 mile farm, and in the center you had a fenced in enclosure for uh, turtles, rabbits, and vultures. A vulture, if it breaks out of the enclosure, it just flies over the fence. There's nothing you can do, it happens so fast. So really, really fast growing aggressive cancers are super rare. You'll hardly ever see those. If you're young and you get one of those, they'll make a movie about you. But it's super, super rare. Um, the other type of cancer is a rabbit. And people usually, when they think cancer, they're thinking a rabbit. The rabbit, if it gets out, it's still got miles and miles to go. you got a very good chance to catch it, slow it down, prevent it from killing you. So by definition for our example here, to get out beyond the fences of the farm, that's to die. So when people hear the word cancer, they're thinking rabbit. Stop them, trap it, okay, kill the cancer cells, chemo, surgery, radiation, etc. But what I'm going to tell you here is the vast majority of cancers are turtles, meaning they're so slow growing, they're not going to kill the patient. And you got to be careful with a turtle that you don't overtreat it. Let's say you got a turtle type cancer in your prostate, a very slow growing cancer. You don't want to do some big fancy surgery or radiation, which might give you tremendous side effects. You know, if your PSA is staying low and it's not moving, now, don't get me wrong, you have to know a lot more detail about this, but I'm just telling you, this is a general concept. Turtles are so slow growing that you're going to die of something else. So you don't want to overtreat them because you could potentially die from the side effects of overtreatment. Okay, now this next slide, this is like one of the most important slides in the whole talk. And this will be the last slide for this uh, part two lecture. So basically, we talked about a bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, running on uh, metabolism of glycolysis, glucose by glycolysis, to make pyruvate and a couple of ATP, two ATP, all right? So that's anaerobic bacteria metabolism. Well, a cancer cell is very much like that. A normal human cell does its uh, energy production primarily from oxidative metabolism in the mitochondria, like we sort of talked about earlier. Krebs cycle in the matrix, electron transport in the inner mitochondrial membrane with production of ATP. Okay, here's what's unique about a cancer cell. A cancer cell can't do so much with oxygen, so it needs to do a lot more with glucose. So it'll often have 100 times as much glucose coming into the cell. You'll have more glucose type 1 transporters on the plasma membrane. It also wants more fat, so it'll upregulate uh, fat receptors like CD36, for example. Um, it'll need more iron, so it'll uptake, uptake, it'll have more in its plasma membrane of transferrin uh, binding proteins. Transferrin is the protein that transfers iron around in the blood. So if you deprive the tumor of iron by not eating you know, any red meat or things that are high in iron, red wine and uh, iron fortified foods, you help and you maybe donate blood to get your serum ferritin down to 25 to 80, you can avoid giving iron to the cancer. It needs that iron to grow. So you can sequester iron, minimize bodily iron by minimizing, lowering your serum ferritin. And that's part of a Fabian strategy to, or, a, or a scorched earth policy strategy to prevent the cancer from growing. And then, of course, you avoid meat, so you avoid leucine and methionine, which would be activating mTOR. Um, you avoid the high fat because they'll have a tendency to end up uh, leading to increased insulin-like growth factor from the insulin resistance. And that also helps activate tumor growth. So what you want to do is create a, a, a tumor microenvironment or tumor milieu that's unfavorable to the cancer growth. Again, it tends to run on hypoxia and, and acidity, so you want hyperoxygenation, alkalinity. Okay, um, and this cancer cell, it's not like one mutation, it's a transformation of life. It's a new way for a cell to grow, going on anaerobic metabolism and trying just to replicate itself and move to somewhere else. And like I said, it can run everything off glutamine, which is why I think the keto, the keto paleo diet approach just doesn't make sense. And I've heard some people say, well, a modified keto paleo diet whereby they also give the patient, you know, glutamate, glutamine inhibitors. The problem is you're going to be inhibiting all your other normal cells as well. I don't, I don't think that's going to work. Um, so, anyways, uh, this will be the end of part two, and we'll cover some other things in a future lecture. But this is a real important point. All the things you can do to slow down mTOR. Avoiding the iron, avoiding the high fat, avoiding the animal protein. Uh, they're all good ways to slow down uh, cancer growth. So that's it for this number two part.